Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy and what might have been. The question haunted some of us for decades, would America be different today if his father had lived? When I was a kid in the mid-1950s, I used to play touch football with Robert F. Kennedy, the father, and his crew on a field in Georgetown. I remember one Saturday morning when, despite being conspicuously pregnant, Ethel Kennedy was in the game. She lined up as a wide receiver. Bobby, as usual, was captain and quarterback. Ethel faked right, then cut to the inside, and her husband threw her a perfect spiral. She bobbled it, the ball doing a little dance in midair for a second, and then she dropped it. Bobby, infuriated, cussed her out. The baby in Ethel's womb that morning was Robert F. Kennedy Jr. For me, Bobby Jr. seems to float in the interval between then and now, dislocated in time. His name, as he challenges Joe Biden for the Democratic presidential nomination, arrives as a sort of double-take, trailing not-quite-dissipated contrails of the old story, heroism, martyrdom and scandal. There's the admixture of later gossip about drugs, Kennedy family dysfunction, and, more recently, a tainted obsession with vaccine conspiracies. The long-ago boy is now 69, which America once considered the age of an old man. Dwight Eisenhower was only a year older when he left the White House for retirement in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Bobby Jr.'s voice is strained and cracked. He suffers from spasmodic dysphonia, a voice disorder that afflicted his grandmother Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy as well. The condition makes him sound like Margaret Hamilton playing the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. But one gets used to it. Otherwise he speaks well and uses words with notable intelligence. There is a touch of his father's charismatic urgency in the forward drive of his rhetoric. He has the face of a man in late middle age, with grooves like parentheses on either side of the mouth. When he talks, his face looks now and then like Norman Mailer's, intensity in the eyes, perhaps, an air of prophecy, the ancient mariner. His hair doesn't flop forward, the way his boyish fathers did, but flows straight back from his forehead. Would I vote for him? I wouldn't vote for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Mr. Kennedy's still unreal candidacy takes sly advantage of this disconsolate process of elimination. Even allowing for the touch of nuttiness, I would give him respectful attention. Right now, the 2024 presidential election is at the stage of what in 1939, after Hitler's invasion of Poland, they called the phony war. Over the summer, the reality of 2024 will start to emerge from the mist. The current disillusion feels familiar. In the 1970s, after assassinations, abdications and Vietnam, a pessimism about the American future descended. Lyndon B. Johnson let his hair grow long over his collar, started smoking cigarettes again, and died at his ranch in Texas. Richard Nixon flew away to bitter exile in California. Jimmy Carter became president, and his one term felt like the middle age of the novelist John Updike's character Rabbit Angstrom, the time of gasoline lines, oil shortages, Japanese cars, and the death of American leadership. Malaise was the word. In those days, a question would haunt some of us, an old ghost, what if RFK had lived? He could have been elected president in 1968 instead of Nixon. He could have gone on to re-election in 1972. The country might have been different. What would have happened in Vietnam? We used to ask that. There would have been no Watergate, no Ford, no Carter and arguably no Reagan. The what-if pops up again in 2023 in the context of Bobby Jr.'s candidacy. Some Americans, hearing the name again, momentarily toy with the fantasy of the father's story resumed in the sun. The notion seems idle, unreal. But name recognition, an involuntary reflex, can be powerful. I think of the 2020s now and then as a surreal extension of the 1960s, as if the 1960s had grown old and corrupt, the baby boom's great adventure played out at last. These are the 60s bereft of their naivete and idealism. The 21st century's sense of catastrophe is more fantastical, elaborate and paradoxical than the one we knew in the 60s. 
The country struggles today with its surreal identity crises and conspiracy theories, the most vivid of them being artificial intelligence, which schemes to supplant the faltering human mind and take over the world. There's an Alice in Wonderland weirdness about all this, a sense not only of decline but of inverted reality, as if Americans had chosen dementia, compounded by mediocrity, as their preferred lifestyle. Or maybe the 21st century's spiritual disturbance is mostly a media hysteria, a tremendous metaphysical imposture of the screens. Bobby Sr., in his brief presidential campaign in spring 1968, united disparate constituencies, blacks and blue-collar whites, George Wallace voters and traditional liberals, in a counterintuitive coalition that just might have worked. Bobby Jr., the longest of long shots, plays to that memory. The tribal Kennedys have always made their way forward by repeating Jack's inaugural metaphor, now flickering in a little threadbare, the torch has passed to a new generation. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy and what might have been. The question haunted some of us for decades, would America be different today if his father had lived? When I was a kid in the mid-1950s, I used to play touch football with Robert F. Kennedy, the father, and his crew on a field in Georgetown. I remember one Saturday morning when, despite being conspicuously pregnant, Ethel Kennedy was in the game. Three reasons were stuck with Trump and Biden. If 2016 was the most important election in our lifetimes, 2024 is shaping up to be the most dispiriting. We appear to be heading for a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump that almost no one wants except the candidates. In an April NBC poll, nearly two-thirds of voters said they did not think Trump should run for president again, and more than two-thirds said the same thing about Biden, in large part because they think he's too old. How did a once great nation end up facing an election between two very old, very unpopular white dudes? I can sketch out the proximate causes. On the Republican side, just as in 2016, a massive primary field is splitting the votes of the moderates, giving Trump plenty of room to consolidate his ultramaga minority. Democrats, meanwhile, have no good options as long as the vice presidency is occupied by the hapless Kamala D. Harris whose impolitic blurtings, inability to hold staff and tendency to choke under pressure make her an even less appealing candidate than her boss. Every Democratic operative I've asked blanched at the thought of running her, and also agreed that for reasons of coalition management, she cannot be pushed aside. Yet that only describes the problem, it does not explain why we seem stuck with two broadly disliked candidates, one already in his 80s and the other turning 78 before Election Day 2024. Nor does it explain America's broader problem of political gerontocracy, as embodied by Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat California, who seems too cognitively impaired to fully carry out her duties or to realize she ought to retire. First, there's the fact that American politics rewards 